So we'll be doing a season basis. Um, firstly, you must know the difference of the definitions given by two different scientists. They can ask you to give a definition according to Lori um, Bronsted or Arrhenius. So obviously the one of um, Arrhenius is a limited definition. That is the first thing that you must know. Um, and then the one of um, Lori Bronsted is the one that is used. So I'll give you definitions based on um, both, right? The definition of Arrhenius and definition of Lori, right? So Arrhenius um, defined an acid as a substance that produces hydrogen or hydronium ions when it is um, dissolved in water. So according to Arrhenius, he said that the acid will release either hydrogen or hydronium ions when it is dissolved in water. And he said that the base is a substance that releases the hydroxide ions when it is dissolved in water. And then Lori came, um, Lori Pronstein came and said that the acid is a proton donor, right? By proton, we mean the hydrogen ions, right? It is a proton donor, meaning that it donates the protons. I'll explain how. And then the base is a proton Accept, meaning that it will accept the protons that it gets from the acid. So those are the two definitions you should know um, from these two scientists. But as I said, that this is the one that will be sticking to, right? That is the one that we'll be using. So in terms of um, the proton donor, we have proteins that can donate one proton. We have proteins that can donate, not proteins. We have acids that can donate one proton. We have do, uh, proteins. Uh, we have um, acids that can donate two um, protons, and we have those which can um, donate three. So the ones that can donate one, we call them uh, monoprotein, right? We say that they're monoprotein, just like your hydrochloric acid. It can give us the hydro, um, hydrogen ion and the chloride ion, right? It is giving us only one. And then we have the sulfuric acid, the sulfuric acid can give us two hydrogens, right? As you can see that it, it can first give us the hydrogen and then we'll be left with one hydrogen and then it will be like that, right? But this can also lose, this one can also lose another hydrogen, right? And then it will be, we will only be left with SO4, um, we will be only left with the sulfate. I hope that makes sense. So you can see that it lost the first one here, it lost the second one here. So we say when it is like this, we say that it is diprotic. Diprotic meaning that it can give us two protons. This one is monoprotic. Monoprotic meaning that it can only give us one proton. Then we have um, substances that can give us three. The example of that one is the um, phosphoric acid, right? We have the we have H3PO4, right? Since it has three here, it means that it can give you three, right? You'll follow the same thing, meaning that firstly, we can have, it can give us one and then we'll be left with PO4 minus. This minus means it will be minus, this minus means that it has lost one, right? Obviously, sorry, we have H2 here instead of H3, because it has lost one. This H2 will lose one uh, proton also. Every time it loses a proton, you add a minus, meaning that it is in short of the protons. I hope that makes sense, right? So this is just to explain that it's not always the case that the acid will lose one proton. It depends on the type of acid it is. So the easiest way is to check the number of hydrogen ions. If it has two like this one, it means that it can lose two. If it has one, it can only lose one. If it has three, it can lose all three. But um, how many protons it will lose, it will depend on the substance that it is reacting with. I hope that makes sense. So that will bring us to what we call the conjugate acid base pairs. These ones, they like them, right? So the conjugate acid base pairs, um, for you to master them, you should just know that an acid, when it loses a proton, it will form a conjugate base, right? So when we have an acid, 
when it loses um, a proton, right? Let's say it loses a proton, it will produce a conjugate phase. The example I gave you was the one of hydrochloric acid. It will lose a hydrogen ion, and then it will also produce the chloride ion. This chloride is what we call the conjugate base, right? I hope that makes sense. And in case of an SC of a base, when the base accepts a proton, it will form the conjugate SC. So if you have a base and this base accepts a proton, it will form a what? A conjugate SC. I hope that makes sense. Right, so the example I can give you here is let's take um, NaOH, right? So this NaOH, that's, that is the base, right? Okay, it, it wouldn't make sense in this um, example. Let me do this, let me do this. Sorry, you'll understand the whole thing because they won't give you individually as I do. Let me rather give you like this. Let's say we have um, nitric acid. We react it with water. Obviously, most of the time, these things are reversible reactions, right? So we um, add it with water to get the nitrate. And we get the hydronium hydro um, ions, right? So this is the reaction. I want you to check something. Firstly, what do we have? We, we have this one here. We don't know whether this is, okay, by now we know that this is a, a nitric acid as I told you, right? So let's assume that we didn't know because this is what we call an ampholite. I will tell you about ampholites. Meaning water can either be a base or an acid depending on what it reacts with. So let's say we didn't know that this is a nitric acid, right? So how would we know that this is an acid to check on what is happening on the right hand side. You can see that we had HNO3. This side we have NO3 minus, right? I told you that always when it has this minus, it means what? It means that it has lost what a proton, right? So if it has lost the proton, lost, right? Meaning that it has donated. It had it before it doesn't have it anymore. So since it had it on the left hand side and it doesn't have it here, it means that it lost it, it donated it. And what did we say about substances that donate protons? We said they are called acids, right? So this is your acid number one, right? Because it donated what? A proton. How do we know that it donated a proton? It has an H this side, it doesn't have an H this side, right? So meaning this one is a what? It's a base, right? That one is a, is a base. So we call this base one, right? So this is a what? It's a con conjugate acid base pair. It had a proton before it lost it, right? This one, it was H2, right? H2O, here it is H3, right? So meaning from H2 to H3, it received an additional hydrogen. So if it received an additional hydrogen, as you can see that with that plus, it received an additional hydrogen, that means that it received. So what did we say about those? Um, substances that accept the proton, we said they are called bases, right? So this is a base. This one is base two. This one is acid two, right? So that is what we call the S, the conjugate um, acid base pairs. Conjugate acid base pairs. It, it had one, it doesn't have, so it means it deleted. It had two, it has three, so it means this one accepted an extra one. I hope that makes sense. Don't cram them, try to do them the same way I'm doing them. I'll try to give you more examples, right? Because I don't, I want to cover everything, but I want the video to be too short um, at the same time. So I hope everything makes sense, right? I'll give you my examples for you to practice, but you follow the same thing. Understand according to Lord, um, Lord Bronstead that an acid is a substance that donates proteins and the base is a substance that accepts proteins. I hope that makes sense, right? So we move. Um, before you can move, remember I told you about an ampholite. I told you that um, um, water is an example of an ampholite. Now let's go back and discuss exactly what I meant by um, water being an ampholite. What is an ampholite, right? So an ampholite, ampholite or amphiprotic substances, right? But we stick to ampholite. When we say a substance 
is an ampholine, we say that that substance can either be an acid or a base. It can act, right? It can act as a base or as an acid, depending on where what it reacts with, right? So, ampholytes or amphiprotic substances, right? They are also known as amphiprotic substances. They can donate or accept protons, right? So the common ampholytes that we know is H2O. Um, another one is um, HCO3 minus, right? And another one it, um, can be your um, HSO4 minus, right? So it's your water, it's your monocarbonate, right? Um, and then it's your um, hydrogen sulfate or hydrogen carbonate, this one, right? So those are the example of the, I think the common examples of the of the ampholite, right? So they can use them in a lot of examples, right? How would you know whether this ampholite could be an acid or a base? You follow what I just told you. You check what it was on the left hand side, and then you check what it is on the right hand side. That will tell you whether it is accepted the proton or it has lost some, then by so doing, you'll be able to tell whether it is an acid or a piece. So let me give you an example with the hydrogen sulfate. So with that one, we can say that um, we have the hydrogen um, sulfate here, right? And then we add it with water, right? We add water to it. And then when we add water to it, we get, um, sulfate, right? And we get um, H, the hydronium ions. So here, without anyone telling you, right? Let me give you another one. We have the same substance, right? We still react it to water, but now we get the different, um, we get the different products. So these two things are different, right? As you can see, them. those two things, those two reactions are different. So let's see what is the difference. Number one, we know that we have the same substance. We don't know whether it is an acid or a base because it is an ampholite, right? We said it is an acid or a base depending on what it reacts with. And we can see that both of them react with water, which water also is an Ampholite. So we are reaching an ampholite with an ampholite, right? So what we can see here is that this side we have H um, SO4 minus, this side we have SO4 2 minus. So it had an a hydrogen, it doesn't have. So it means this one donated an hydrogen because this side it doesn't have. So meaning this one is what is an acid because it donated. This one is a base because it, it lost. Um, this one is an acid because it has um, lost the hydrogen, right? It has donated, right? So, um, okay, let's not do the acid base test, but this one has H2O, it has H2, this side it has H3, so meaning this one is a, it's a base, right? This one is base um, one, right? So this one is a base, which accepted it is a base it has two now it has three right so meaning this one is a, an acid okay the reason why this one won't be is i made a mistake it's not a reversible this one, right it can't be reversible so it's one way it can't be reversible so if it's not reversible we can't have the acid base test because we can't call this one an acid because if we call this one a base it will accept when we come this way right so it's still fine so we can say this one is acid two, this one is base one, right? This is base two. It's fine, but this one is one way, right? But I hope you understand what I'm saying. It has an H here, it doesn't have an H, so it means it don't. So it is acting as an acid. Here it is acting as an acid. We come here, it has an H, now it has another H, right? So it means it has accepted an extra H because it had one, now it has two. So when it accepts, what do we call it? We call it a base, right? So you can see that the same thing 
T8 HHS and SCT8 HHS phase. I hope that makes sense. Because it was one here, it is two here. So this one, it is two, it has lost. It was H2O, now it is just OH. So this one, since it lost, this one is an acid, right? This one is an acid. This one is a base, right? I hope that makes sense, right? And this one obviously is an acid because when we go back, it is donating, right? It is donating H2, now it is H because it is reversible. I hope that makes sense. So that is how you understand the amphorites, right? Now you understand by, um, what I mean by amphorites being either an acid or a base, depending on what it reacts with. So I'll also give you more examples on that one. So what I want us to focus on now, another thing you have to know that the acids can be concentrated or they can be dilute, right? Whether it is concentrated or dilute, that depends on the concentration, right, that it has. So why, since we are speaking about the concentration, we should know that um, the concentration, what is concentration? Concentration is the number of moles of a substance per unit volume. So in simplest terms, this is concentration, right? It is the number of moles per unit volume. And we know that the number of moles is the mass all over the molar mass, right? So we can combine these two formulas because if we substitute this n, where there is n, if we put this here, we will end up having something like um, m all over the molar mass multiplied by v, right? v being your volume, right? So you can use this formula or you can use this formula for what? For concentration, depending on what you have. If you are given number of moles, you can straight come here. If you are not given, you can come and use the mass and the molar mass of that substance, right? But um, what do we mean when we say that um, uh, we have either a concentrated base or a concentrated acid? What we simply mean is that we have a large number of um, moles compared to the volume, right? Meaning that um, we have more concentrated, it's, this thing is like, Let's say you take um, sugar, right? You take coffee, you make coffee on one cup, right? It is the same. Let's say it's two, both, they are both, uh, both cups are 250 minutes. On the other cup, you put two um, spoons of sugar. On the other cup, you put five spoons of sugar. Which one is more concentrated? Obviously, it will be the one, the one which you put more spoons of sugar. So it is the same thing here. The one that has a lot of, um, or a huge number of, number of moles, but less volume, it is concentrated. The one that has less number of moles and a large volume, um, then it is what? It is diluted. I hope that makes sense, right? So that is how you know. Um, when we have a concentrated strong acid or a concentrated weak acid or a concentrated, um, whether it is strong or weak acid or a base, as long as it's concentrated, you will have about one mole per decimeter cube of that substance, right? You have one um, mole per decimeter cube of that substance. Then we say that that substance is concentrated. But if you have, let's say 0 0.01 mole per decimeter cube of that substance, then that substance is diluted, right? This one is dilute. This one is concentrated, right? I hope that makes sense. Meaning that if it has a higher concentration, it is concentrated. If it has low, it is diluted. But that concentration and dilution, we check it in um, reference to the number of moles compared to the volume it has. I hope that makes sense. So that then is not a difficult concept. Now I want us to focus on the strong and the weak acids and bases, right? We have acids and bases that can be strong, and we have those ones that can be weak. Right, so what is the difference between the two? What you have to know is that the strong acids are the ones that ionize completely in water. By ionize completely in water, we mean that they completely form ions. And then the weak acids are the ones that um, partially get ionized, right? They partially form ions, not fully. Same thing with your bases. The bases, the strong bases, the one that dissociates completely in water. And the weak bases are the ones that dissociate partially in water. 
I hope that makes sense also. So what is the difference between dissociation and um, ionization? Um, dissociation is um, when we say that substance, these two things are not um, that much um, of a difference, but when we say that the substance, the substance dissociates, we say that it was initially in a, an ionic form. So it is easier for it to form ions, right? It's like the ions are already existing. But when that we say that it is ionized, we mean that it is either a, a metal, um, it was a metal, right? And then it had to form ions. It was not already ionic, right? But they, they are not that um, different. What you just have to know is that when they say it's a strong acid, that it is completely ionized. If it's a strong base, it is completely dissociated. If it is a weak base, it is partially ionized. If it is um, a weak base, it is partially dissociated. So I will just give you the examples of the strong and the weak bases, the common ones that you have to know, the ones that they like um, using, right, in your exams, right? Um, another thing, while we are still there, although, um, although ammonia is a base, right? Although ammonia is a base, but it is an exception. It is the only one which ionizes, right? That is an exception. Although this is a base, we say bases dissociate. This is an exception because it ionizes, although it is a base. I hope that makes sense if I forget. Um, so one, one, what you have to know is that um, whether an acid is strong on or weak, that will affect the reaction rate and it will also affect the conductivity. Right? By conductivity, I mean that um, the strong acid will have high concentration. Right? And if it has high concentration, it will have high, um, greater conductivity. In terms of the reaction rate, if we have a strong acid, it has a higher concentration, therefore it will have a higher concentration, or it will have a higher rate. So what I'm basically saying is that the reaction rate and conductivity, both are directly proportional to the strength of the acid or the base. If the acid is strong, then it will have higher reaction rate and um, it will have greater reaction rate and higher conductivity. If it is weak, it will have less reaction rate and less conductivity, right? Hopefully that um, clarifies it. So the, the weak and the, um, 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 in the strong bases that we have that are common, um, we start with the acids, right? The hydrochloric acid, the nitric acid, and lastly, the sulfuric acid. These are referred as strong acids, right? They are referred as strong acids. The strong bases that you have, it's your sodium hydroxide, you have your potassium hydroxide, right? Those two are referred, are the common used um, strong bases, right? Common used strong bases. And then as for them, Weak bases, we can take um, ammonia, since we just mentioned it. We can take ammonia. We can take sodium bicarbonate. Um, sodium bicarbonate, we can take calcium carbonate. And um, we can also take sodium hydrogen carbonate, right? Sodium hydrogen carbonate. All of these, they are weak. Bases, right? And then for the weak acids, we can take um, phosphoric acid, since we mentioned it when we were talking about the number of protons that it can donate. Um, we can take um, ethanoic acid or acetic acid, which is CH3, um, COOH. Um, and then we can also take carbonic acid. And um, lastly, we can take the, um, there's many of them. We can also take the hydrofluoric acid, hydrofluoric acid, um, and also 
um, hydrofluoric acid, the oxalic acid as well, right? So, and um, the sul um, sulfurous acid, right? Sulfurous is H2SO3 instead of SO4. So all of these, all of these ones, they are weak acids. So why am I giving you these ones? Because these ones are the ones that they use, the examiners use most of the time, right? That you will see. So you must normalize um, yourself, um, just normalize knowing the ones I just gave you here and you shall be sorted, right? I don't think you, have, you will have any complications answering any questions, right? So that brings us to what, to what we call the pH scale, right? Because the pH scale is the scale that represents whether we are looking at the base. Let's say we, um, we have a substance and it's not in either of these substances that I just gave you, right? Or rather, even if it's there, how did they know where, whether the substance was a base or an acid, right? They, they, they did um, the pH scale, right? So um, by pH, we mean the pH um, scale represents the number. Um, 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 or rather, let me say the pH represents um, the acidity or alkalinity uh, of a solution. So by pH, we mean um, it is a number that represents whether a substance is acid or basic, right? It is, is it acidic or basic, right? So what we mean is that we look at the concentration of the hydronium ions, right? How do we do that? The pH is calculated by this formula, negative log on and the concentration of what? Of the hydrogen, um, hydronium, sorry, hydronium ions. If there is greater concentration of ions in the solution, then it means that it will be more acidic and the solution will have a lower pH. So if we have increased um, hydronium ions, then we will have less pH. If this is the case, then we say that the substance is acid. If we have low concentration of hydrogen, um, hydronium ions, then the pH will tend to be high. So if this is the case, then we have acidic substance. I hope that makes sense. Right, so the pH scale looks something like this, right? It ranges from zero to seven, um, zero to 14, sorry. And then we have seven in between. This seven means that the substance is neutral. It is neither basic or um, acidic. So from seven to 14, we have basic substances. From zero to seven, we have acidic substances. So if your pH is from zero anyway to between zero, right? Greater than zero, let me just say, it is greater than zero, but less than seven, then we say that it is acid. But if it is greater than seven, but less than 14, right? Then we say that it is basic. I hope that makes sense, right? Sort of for putting inequalities of net and everything. But it's just to show you that if it ranges from zero up to close to seven, then it is acid. From there to there, it is easy. I hope that makes sense and I'm not confusing you. So, what the question that they like asking that you should know is that the pH scale is a range of zero to 14, as I just told you. But the important thing is knowing when it is measured. It is measured um, by hydronium the concentration of hydronium ions, as I told you, right? And it is measured um, at 25 degrees. We do it when the temperature is 25 degrees in water, right? 25 degrees in water. Then that is how we measure the acid, the pH, I mean to say, right? I hope that makes sense. So um, I know I've said a lot of things. I'm actually trying to give you everything in one video. I'm sorry if it will be too long. <clears throat> so another thing that you have to know about the acid, um, the acids and the bases is the acid um, reactions, right? 
So I'll just tell you when, what, if, with what, um, what is the product? How will that help you? That will help you in terms of knowing which products you should expect, right? Because um, in chemistry, sometimes it can be difficult for you to um, get the products if you don't know exactly what the products can be, right? You'll end up mixing things and giving um, off um, wrong things. So with acid reactions, remember that the acid reactions are what? They are reactions during which protons are transferred because we said the acid um, substances, acidic substances, they are the ones that do what? They um, donate protons, right? So if we take an acid, right? We take an acid, this will be reaction number one. We take an acid, we react it with a metal. We all know where metals are found in the community. Any metal, the product um, will be salt and, and, um, and hydrogen. The product will be salt and hydrogen, right? That is reaction number one. Reaction number two, we can get an acid and react it to a base. We can react it to a base or we can react it to a metal oxide. A base or a metal oxide. Still, the product will be salt and water. These are the products. Meaning always when you react this acid and the bees, the product should be water and salt. The third, um, the third and last one that you can get is when we take an acid and we react it with metal carbonate, not metal oxide this time. Metal carbonate, a metal that is joined with the carbonate. Here is a metal that's joined with oxygen, which is metal oxide. The product here will be salt, and water and carbon dioxide. This will be the three products, right? I hope that makes sense. So let me give you an example, right? I'll just give you a random example, then we'll see which one of those it is. So let's say, for example, um, they tell you that you have. Um, Hydrochloric acid, right? And they join the, the, the mix hydrochloric acid with magnesium oxide, right? And the product is, they ask you what is the product. So you can see that we actually here we are reacting what? We're reacting an acid with a metal oxide. And we said always when we react an acid with a metal oxide or a base, we get what? Salt and water. So already we know that we must get water as our product. How will we get water as our product? Obviously, um, we just have to balance, right? We know that we'll get water as the product. We already know that, that water will be the product. And we also know that we'll get salt. Well, the salt comes, the salt is not only sodium chloride. It comes in many forms. We can have different types of salt. So, but we already know that we have water as the product. So if we have water as the product, what will be left with? We can see that water will be made by this H and this O. What will be left with? We'll be left with the magnesium and the chloride, right? So meaning that the salt will be formed by magnesium chloride. And we know that magnesium is two. Chloride is minus one. So it's Mg2 plus and Cl minus. And you know that this, when you, you must balance this here. Right? Or the easiest way is to take this here and take that one here, right? So you have MgCl2. So that is why we have MgCl2. If this doesn't make sense, please let me know. I'll explain more, right? So already we know what the products are. Now it's just a matter of balancing the equation. So we know since we have two hydrogens here, we have one here, we have to put two here, right? Because we have two H, two H, two Cl, two Cl, right? We have one O, one O, one MG, one H. So this is a clear example, right? Another example that I can um, give you, the one I want you to do for me, we take the same hydrochloric acid. Now we react it with, um, let's say, calcium carbonate. Give me the products and balance the equation, right? I want you to do that one for me. So 
So far, so good, right? I hope um, 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 the information is not too much, right? Um, so another thing that we can do is what they call hydrolysis of solids. So by hydrolysis, um, what is hydrolysis? Because obviously hydrolysis means, hydro means water. So what is a hydrolysis reaction? Hydrolysis is the reaction of an ion with water. When we, when we react an ion with water, we call that a hydrolysis, right? So what is the purpose of this? Is whether to know whether the salt we are going to create, whether it's going to be an acidic salt, a neutral salt, or an alkaline salt. So this is what we have to do. Let me do this. If we have an acid and we have a base, obviously we want to see the type of salt we will have. So if we have a strong acid and we have a weak base, we will get a salt that is acidic because the one that is strong is acid, right? If we have a um, strong acid and we have a strong base, we will get a neutral salt because the two can say, right? If we have a weak base and a weak acid, we we'll still get a neutral salt. But if we have a, um, a weak acid and we have a strong salt, the salt that we get will be alkaline, meaning, meaning that it will be basic. So it depends on which one is strong, which one is weak, right? I hope that makes sense. So sometimes they won't just give you clearly the salt, they will just give you a reaction and ask you to find which salt it is, right? Whether the salt is basic or the salt is um, acidic, right? So what am I saying? Let me give you an example. I, I'm so good people. I know by now the video, it's too long. I'm sure it's 40 minutes or 30 something, right? So let's say we have, um, Let's say we have um, ammonium chloride like that. And they ask you um, to determine the pH of a salt, right? Or rather to say whether the salt that will be formed is acidic or basic. How will we know? The first thing to do is to, subs to, to break down what we are given, the substance we are given. So from this, we know that this will form what? We form ammonium and chloride. That is what we need, right? That it will form ammonium and chloride, right? We know that this ammonium, when it go, it's going to react with water, the product will be what? When it's going to react with water, it is going to donate one H, right? So we'll be left with an H3, right? We'll be left with NH3 plus the hydrogen, um, hydronium ions, because one is going to be added here. This is what we need, right? And then what do we know about this chloride? We know that this chloride, when it reacts with water, that it's going to form what? What do we know about that chloride? We know that this H is going to be given to this, and we're going to get hydrochloric acid, and we are going to get this H from here will be left with one H, so we'll be having a hydroxide. So from here, how can we tell whether the salt that is going to form is going to be basic or it's going to be um, acidic? Okay, we look at the product. This is HCl. HCl, I told you that, that that's hydrochloric acid and it's a strong acid. So we have a strong acid. We are reacting it with um, ammonium, which is a weak base. Right? So we have a weak base. I told you that when we have a strong acid and a weak base, strong acid, weak base, what's the product? It's a strong salt. That is how you get to that conclusion. I hope that makes sense. I really hope it makes sense. So that's that, right? And then from there, um, you, 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 you will be given um, another way to find whether something is acidic or basic, will be given indicators. So what is an indicator? An indicator is a compound that um, is going to change the color according to, it's just a paper, right? Um, that is going to change the color according to the pH of the substance. And we use it during titrations. 
I'm going to explain what the take ratio is. So you, the indicators we have, um, it's four of them that you should need, right? We have the litmus, we have the methyl orange, we have the uh, phenolphthalein, we have the promo, um, promothermal blue. So you should know, you should know, you should know. So, um, you should check the, what you call, the colors of, you, you must know the colors of this thing because obviously they will ask you. But what you have to know is, if we are talking, if we have the litmus, right? I will tell you the color when it is an acid and tell you the color with, when it is a base, right? Um, and then we, I said we can also have methyl orange as another indicator. We can have um, promothermal blue. And lastly, we can have um, phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein. So in, in case of um, the litmus, litmus paper, when, if you put it inside the solution, if that solution is an acid, the paper will turn to be red. If it is base, the paper will turn to be blue. Right. If you have methyl orange and you put you put it in an acidic solution, it will be red. If you put it in a basic solution, it will be yellow. If you take promethamine blue in acidic solution, it will be yellow. And in a basic solution, it will be blue. If you take phenolphthalein in acid, it will be colorless. But in um, base, it will be pale pink. From there, you can go to your textbook and see the pH ranges of these things. Right? But that is the basic information they're expecting you to know. So I spoke about titrations. So in a titration, this is what happens. I didn't want the video to be too long, but I wanted to finish everything in one video, right? So with um, titrations, firstly, we must know what is a titration. Obviously, it is a practical of some sort, and we should know the apparatus that are found in the titration. So a titration is just a, a practical that is being done in the lab to determine the concentration of an acid or a base, right? So we take the concentration of an acid or a base and we want to determine the accurate um, concentration using what we call the standard solution, right? We use what we call the standard solution. So what is standard solution? Standard solution is a solution of known concentration. We know the concentration of this, right? We have no concentration. That is the standard um, solution. So we will have neutralization because we are mixing in acid and base, right? So when we react those two, we will stop at the, what we call the equivalence point. So the equivalence point is not actually the point where the, the, the solution is supposed to, the pH is supposed to be seven, right? But the point at which the acid and the base have completely reacted, right? Then we call that the equivalence point. According to the molar ratio, right? The point at which they have um, completely reacted according to the molar ratio, that is what we call the the equivalence point. So how do we calculate this, right? It's what we know, I used to call it tab, right? We have number of moles of an acid and we have number divided by the number of moles of a base. 
right? So this is uh, bah. This is the concentration of an acid, the volume of an acid, concentration of a piece, uh, volume of a piece. That is how you are able to find what you are looking for in um, the right? You can, uh, and here you should know how to convert um, the different um, units of volume. They can use cubic meters, they can use milliliters, they can use um, decimeter cube, they can use liters, um, all of those you should know. But what happens in the titration setup? Right now that we know all this, the titration setup involves um, two things, right? We have what we call the conical flask. So I'm not good at drawing, but you have a flask like that, right? And then inside this flask, what is the? It is a base, right? So this will indicate the volume of a of a base. And then somewhere up there, we have what we call the buret, right? So you have the buret, right? So that will be releasing drops, right? So this buret um, will be carrying what? Will be carrying acid. So inside the buret, we'll be having the volume of the acid. And then somewhere there, there's something that is controlling the number of drops. We call that the stop cock. So that is how we are able to um, then at the equivalence point, um, we shake this and then we put the indicator, right? So what actually happens here is that we take what we call the, the, the pipette, right? And we, we we put the standard solution in the clinical class. And then after that, the standard solution is normally a base. And then after that, we add the appropriate indicator to the flask. Um, and then we fill the buret with the solution of unknown concentration, right? Here we put unknown concentration, here we put known concentration. And then from there, what will happen is that um, we add the solution from the buret into the conical flask, these drops, right? And then after we add, we shake a bit, right? We shake or we swell, right? Um, so we shake and then after we stop the buret, when an indicator shows neutralization or equivalence point that has been reached, we are done with our titration. So they, they won't always throw this, but they will always give you statements in terms of, in cases of um, titrations. So they will tell you that maybe during a titration, this amount of what, what is being put in these, this, this, in this, in this. And then from there, what I advise you to always do is that from each and every statement I give you, write a chemical reaction from that statement. Then from there, that is how you'll be able to calculate um, what is required. Otherwise, you won't be able to do that. So I hope that all that makes sense. If you have any questions, you'll let me know. I know it is a long video. Sorry for that, but people, I wanted to finish everything in one video. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you.